going to open up his office at that time. I'd write down with him in the morning because I, I didn't know where I was going. You get lost. What year are we talking about? You're working at the Boston store and we're talking about what, 1925, 26, that area? I got married in 1930. In between, I worked for the telephone company. I worked with the Boston Star. I worked at Fannie Mae's. Mm -hmm. So you went Fannie Mae, the Boston store, the phone company. Mm -hmm. And you met your husband while you were working at Boston's? Well, I was with the telephone company. When you were in the telephone company, yeah. okay. Uh, so, do you remember when the, um, the Great Depression, when the stock market crashed? I remember or... everything. And what, how did that affect you personally? No work. So a lot of people were thrown out of work? Well, the big, all the big outfits, all the big owners of those stores, you know, they jumped out of their windows. Yeah. There was nothing on his suicide, the were all committing suicide. They went overnight. Hmm. That's what people but watch the stock market today. Hmm. You can be a millionaire and you can be broke the next day. And you got all those people working for you and you can't pay them. Mm -hmm. They got to pay car fare to get back and forth to work. Mm -hmm. And there's no, there's no, uh, there's no money. Let me set this up right now. Okay. Um, the uh, okay, so you you met Peter, you met your husband, and or your husband to be. Your dates were you went to uh, parks and you went to Irish dances. Yeah, mostly and, Irish dances and the parks on Sunday. Okay, and um, how did he propose to you? <laughs> he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> How did it end up? You just was an understanding you were going to get married? Or? Well, no, I went with him for five years and I was no more interested in getting married than the man on the moon. He was five years older than he was 28 years and I was 23. And uh, I just, uh, I couldn't, I didn't seem to get away. Every place I'd go, he was there. I go to the dances with my girlfriend and uh, when it come time to come, get home, come home, he was always standing at the door. Mm -hmm. Because he'd go home from work and go to bed, and then wake up later and figure I was at the dance and he'd come down and pick me up. <laughs> uh, so you got married in 1930, did you say? 1930, right in the midst of the Depression. Started in 1929. Who was in the wedding party? My sister and my husband's brother. Mm -hmm. Just the two. And what what was uh, what was his name? Huh? Hey, what was his name? Your your husband's brother's name? Johnny. Johnny. Johnny Barrett. Yeah. Okay. And my sister's name was Brian. What did Johnny Barrett do for a living? Johnny worked for for the Elf. I remember that. The L station. Uh, and he pretty much, he worked for the CTA as well for his whole career? My husband worked for CTA. Is that what, is that and what, he, Uncle, did Uncle John do the same thing? Then he got Johnny in with the overall one, you know. Okay. Johnny worked with, uh, at the L station. Mm -hmm. So your husband helped uh, people get, Irish people get jobs with? Uh, well. There was no jobs. Mm -hmm. You had to know somebody. Yeah. There was no jobs. Did he know anybody to get into the CTA? His uncle worked for CTA. His uncle worked for him? Yeah. That's yeah. how he got in. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, So your husband worked for the CTA or the, whatever the name of the company was before it was called CTA. Motor coach. Chicago Motor coach. Yes. Motor coach. And it's Chicago Motor. And at that time you were working at the phone company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, you were living where when you got married? I was living on on Latrobe Avenue, 
1611 North Latrobe. It's on North Avenue. Okay. And, and we got married over at St. Thomas Aquinas Church. At St. Thomas at Austin Boulevard. And then and there were seven weddings this, the day we got there. <laughs> <laughs> so and the priest interviewed us, you know, yeah. great big guy. He was French, and uh, he said uh, he interviewed me first, private interview. Found out of all about you, and of course, naturally, you weren't married. You were only sixteen or seventeen, and he said, uh, "Your your your day of birth." I said, August the 15th, 1907. Well, that was a holy day. And that's how I got my name of Mary. Mm -hmm. So anyway, my husband comes along. His birthday is Christmas Day, the 25th, 25th of December, 1902. Mm -hmm. So when we, we got together afterward and he laughed, the priest said, well, I'll tell you. I have married a lot of people, but never with this, with this special day, one Christmas and one born on the 15th of August. <laughs> Did, uh, what was the priest's name, do you remember, the French priest? The guy who interviewed you, do you remember his name anymore? The priest's name? Yeah, but the priest who... Uh, you say there, yeah, well, you say there was a priest. Donanville, he was French. Okay, Donanville? Donanville, I was long dead. Yeah. Well, I was just wondering if they actually... No, Donanville, I was a great big man. I was just wondering if he actually wrote down your answers somewhere no, no, that could be no. found. I, I can remember his name, Donanville. Yeah, at St. Thomas Aquinas. At St. Thomas, and there were seven weddings that day. So they didn't want you to fool around too long in the church. <laughs> 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 It was funny, and you know, people that didn't have money and that didn't have no big crowd, that didn't have bridesmaids, that didn't have, they were all people that just, maybe the true people, and maybe they had a witness, which they had to have. Not, not, not when he interviewed them, mm -hmm, no, but mm -hmm. when they got married. Mm -hmm. So... And they didn't dress up with all of those gowns, and there was nothing. Yeah. Well, now you can see people spending ten thousand dollars on a wedding. Oh my God! The thing, they're twenty and twenty-five thousand for just a small wedding. Yeah. So that was that. So then. So he's working for Chicago Motor Coach. You're living on La Trobe. You're working for the phone company as an operator. Yeah. Then my father was born in 1931. Am I right about that? Or yeah, yeah Mary Jane 1931. was. 1931. Yeah. Uh, July 2nd. Right. And Mary Jane was born September 2nd, 1932. And did you move after they were born? I mean, when did you move to Ohio Street? Uh, we moved, uh, we, no, we had an apartment. Uh, my husband lost his job. They were out of work, so we moved. We were in an apartment on Ohio Street, one bedroom two kids, and everybody was out of work. Johnny was staying with us. His, his sister Annie, she was doing housework in Oak Park for $5. And my sister Bride was doing housework for $5. And and they almost starved them. When they, when they left there on Thursday, they got Thursday off. They were, they were so hungry, they used up the five bucks to eat. <laughs> So, so and they'd come and stay with us. So, so you had a one-bedroom apartment. One-bedroom apartment. How many people are in it? Well, everybody. When just... they when they'd come when they were out of work, at uh, them days they had a big dining room with a Murphy in it or badge, mm -hmm. which was the greatest thing that was ever invented. It was a great one wall, and it was like a clothes closet. When you open the door, you pull this bed down. Mm -hmm. It was a full-size bed. And you push the dining room table out of the way. And that's where they slept. Mm -hmm. And there was a couch. So you pretty much everywhere was people were sleeping. Every place yeah. they were sleeping. How did uh, how'd your husband lose his job? Just because of the depression? Strike. There was a strike? And he went out on strike? He went out on strike. Against and they Chicago? they never took them back. They never took them back? No, no. 
So what did he do for a living after that? He rented the saloon business. He was, where was the saloon located? 5847 West North Avenue. What motivated him to go into the saloon business? He couldn't get a job. There was nothing to do. He tried all over. Walked night and day. They had holes in their shoes from walking. And there was no work. So anyway, there was a lot of quite a few. Well, was, they had a lot of friends, you know. And they all talked about the liquor was just coming back then. Mm -hmm. The country was dry. So bro prohibition was ending? Prohibition, yes. And they were opening up uh, taverns. So anyway, somebody talked him into it. I was very much against it. Mm -hmm. He said, I have to try something. And uh, he had to have a thousand dollars. I don't know how he managed about the thousand dollars. Yeah, I was going to ask. much a it. month. So did the license was a thousand dollars. The rent was high, and you had to have the dram shop. That's that insurance. If somebody comes in, you know, and gets hurt, mm -hmm. they sue you. Mm -hmm. You had to have all those things: the store rent, the uh, dram shop, the liquor license, mm -hmm. and you know, it, everything was really. And the business beer was a nickel of less. See how you could make yeah. any money. You could get in trouble with <laughs> beer, nickel, and glass. Five cents a glass. Um, did um, so? How long did he run the saloon? Ten years. From when to when you think? Mm -hmm. From like nineteen. And I helped him. Nineteen thirty-three or so, or yeah. what? Do you remember what year he started the bar? I the, think he sold at about forty-five, forty-four, forty-five. Okay. Forty-five. He and, suck, and I used to uh, go up there and put in my eight or ten hours. I'd go when he was home, so the kids weren't alone. They should, were going to school. So if he was there, you were at home, and if he was at home, you were there. Yeah, there was always somebody at home. Did you have other family members working there? No. Did any other family, did any relatives work in the in the saloon? No, no. No. no? There was no money in it to pay anybody. Yeah. So the only employees you work were, seven days a week. Who the just you and you and Grandpa were the only employees? Yeah, we uh, once in a while. He used to uh, once in a while they wanted to go down for the bowling or something when I'd come home and uh, see that everything was okay. Uh, we almost had somebody watch the stay with the kids. They'd call me up and I'd have to go up and let them go. They went, uh, they used to go out to the, uh, where the horses, the racing. There's quite a few people came in there, men that, you know, used to go to those places. So that way he got away. And I'd take over. I'd come back up and work for a couple of hours so they could go. So that's what, that's what he did for relaxation? He'd go to horse races? Uh, not not much, but they did. They went to the out to the track, or to a football game, or whatever was. He didn't go very far. <laughs> but when I think of him, I just think of working and working and sleeping, eating, and then going back to work. No, no, he could. Uh, he always depended on me. I'd go up and work there, and he was home, got the kids out to school, and fix their lunch for them. Mm -hmm. And then by the time they come home, I was home. He was up there. We had a, a colored guy that used to come in and clean the place every morning. He'd mop it and clean everything. So if he... If there he's was nothing doing. All day long, nobody would come in. And people had no money. Mm -hmm. All you got was a lot of conversation. <laughs> it was a place for them to come. So it was, all right, there's a lot of people, but not a lot of money being, exchanging hands. Yeah. Nobody had any money. Was there, was they there weren't some, working. Was there saloons in the neighborhood? There was, uh, yeah, there was quite a few of them. So why would you pick one saloon over another? Well, the, the, the store, he knew that neighborhood, 
And there was quite a few men that worked for CTA that he knew and for the motor coach. And they used to come, you know, and visit and mm -hmm. bring their families. It was a family place. Mm -hmm. Was there, did you have to, uh, was there any, um, did you have to pay the police to watch out for the place or the Italians uh, the or something like that? The police kept an eye on, they were Austin district. Mm -hmm. And they would drive by. Mm -hmm. If there was any complaints, they'd be right over. Mm -hmm. But then they, there was nothing, you know, it was a family neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And there'd be women go shopping in the afternoon and they'd bring the kids in and leave them to me and they'd sit, you know, to look come back. <laughs> I give them a bowl of popcorn or a bowl of pretzels and they had a great time. <laughs> so we were in Saint, Saint Angeles Parish. So there's no real crime around there. Uh -huh. No real crime and you had no real no. problems with no, 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 people no, or there was no no no. There was nothing. People were oh look how long ago it is. Because, you know, nowadays you'd have to have all kind of security oh, and... no, no, I wouldn't have that business. I was very much against that business. He lost his health there, too, he was not He got nervous and jittery and, uh, you know, you hate to see people drink. And uh, they'll come in drunk from someplace else and give you a lot of trouble. So was he the person who would control the drunks? I tried to console them. T t some of them lived across the street, you know. Did he get into... And I <laughs> take the apron off and take them across the street. He was afraid they'd get run over. <laughs> <laughs> so did he get in, did he ever get in, in, did he ever get into fights or did he get hurt or anything like that? Or? Oh, if, if, if they got hurt, you know, you'd get sued. <laughs> so... So he might have drunks in there, but he didn't have real altercations or nobody was really hurt. No, no. And the kids in the neighborhood, they knew they used to come in with their parents. And sometimes I'd, I'd have a, they'd be all looking in to see if I was there. And uh, they'd come in. Then I'd call their parents and tell them that they were there, that they'd have to, you know, take them across the street mm -hmm. because it was dangerous. Mm -hmm. At this time you did not own a car? You didn't own a car at that time, did you? Have a car? Yeah. Yeah, we had a car. Now, you say he got laid off from Chicago Motor, he, he, he was in a strike at the Chicago Motor Coach. They did not hire the strikers back. No, no. Mm -hmm. um, they just hired replacement workers to come in there? The strike breakers. Did they then, um, you say, but he but he went back to... He went back to the CTA. When they were hiring yeah, years yeah. later. Yeah, yeah. CTA, two different outfits. Yeah. Two different outfits. He went back there just, cause, just because it was a better way of life, regular paycheck, uh, yeah, not as uh, much it work. It was a job. It was a job that didn't make a big salary. It was a job. Do you remember how much money it was? How much? How much money was it? Do you remember? At that time, it was seventy-five cents an hour, mm -hmm. and you had to have twenty-five dollars of your own money in your changer. You had to supply your uniform, <laughs> and it wasn't cheap. And you wore a, a a certain shirt, a blue shirt. And there was only one place. It was a uniform shirt that you bought them. And they have two or three of them, and I drew them up, washed them at home, and ironed them, and you'd wear them. Then in the summer, they had to have a, a different outfit. They had to have a cap that had the holes, you know, in it for the air. Hmm. In the winter, they had a different one. But it was mostly Irish that worked at that job. And he had to have his own change? He had to have twenty-five dollars in his own change. You have to make change for the for the uh, for the people that got on. Yeah. So it was twenty-five dollars of your own money. Your own money. And that's how they that's how they made sure that you paid attention to yeah, how much change yeah. you were giving to people. And the people that got on, they wouldn't have the right. 
today they have to have the right change right. for a pass. Mm -hmm. But they get on, and he said sometimes he'd have 10 or 12 people get on and almost clean them out of change. Hmm. And you had to go to the bank and buy it. Do you, um, do you remember any stories from back then when he was driving the buses and the streetcars of you know any particular things happening to him? Like I remember him telling me stories about, uh, oh, you know, telling people to quiet down or, you know, running over a dog, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> it's all kinds of them. And, and he was a supervisor downtown with the motor coach with the double decks. He was always, they had two times they went to work. They went in the morning while it was busy. And then they come home, they were home all afternoon. And they went back, it was a shift. They went back when it was busy in the evening and got the people on. Mm -hmm. so, so in between, they didn't need them. So what did he do, go home and take a nap? I went downtown when yeah. I was single yet, and he called me up. He said, take a ride down and meet me. <laughs> and I, I took a ride down, and he was busy, very busy, very conscientious, loading up the buses. And he said, he got one bus loaded up and he need, he, he, he sees the, the stuff running down, for the water running down from the second floor. Somebody went up there and peed up there. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm sure he wasn't happy about that. Oh, no. <laughs> Um, and he, so he worked a split shift. He'd work mornings. Yeah, he worked mornings. That, that's what they call the splits. And then he would take a nap or something? He'd go out about 5 o'clock in the morning. And he got down to the barn and pick up his bus. And then when the rush was over, when the people got to work, when the rush was over, he took the bus back to the barn. Mm -hmm. Then he went back in the evening and picked it up again. Mm -hmm. Put in, they put in their eight or nine hours. What did he do between this, the the shifts? He'd come home and rest. Her nerves were shot, so it was a. You got all kinds of people riding. His nerves were shot just from the stress. Of well, nervousness, you know. Mm -hmm. and, you're driving one of those big buses, mm -hmm. and you've got people falling on and off. Did he have any any health problems in general? I mean, like they were hereditary? Oh, uh, health problems? Yeah. I mean, did he have any... Oh, he had, yes. He had that colostomy. And he was uh, laid up for almost six months. And that was caused by um, well, that's tumors in the condition and it's everything else. And of course, he was quite heavy. How heavy and how tall? Well, he wasn't. Uh, I'd say he was about five eight, mm -hmm. and over two hundred pounds. We never bothered about weight that time. But he'd come home and lie down for a couple of hours, and he'd get up and go back again. Then he'd come in on the evening and. Mm -hmm. As a rule, we'd stop and have a few drinks on the way home, come home and eat, and go to bed. He yeah. wasn't a drinker, he wasn't a smoker, mm -hmm. but so. Uh, but he had, a, he had... He'd have a few beers. And, Did he have any problems with, um, I mean, obviously what killed him was a heart problem, right? Did he have, he had a coronary, right? He, he had... What killed him was arterial cirrhosis. Mm -hmm. The arteries were, were blocked. Plugged. Yeah. And at that time, there was nothing. When he died in 66, they were dropping off. They didn't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. Or cholesterol or any of that stuff. Well, I guess it's cholesterol. Well, cholesterol is what causes the blockage, I guess. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. Um, and he, he worked, went out that morning and worked, and no complaints, no nothing. And uh, he'd come home on his swing, 
I talked to a woman down the street. She'd come over that afternoon, she couldn't believe it, and, and rang the doorbell and she said, something happened to your husband? She said, you know, I talk, I waved to him and talked to him across the street when he was going home. She take, said, I take a lease of his life. He was so, you know, and she said, we, we, I said, the weather's getting nice. It was April, it was really nice. And she said, yes, she was an older person, much older. And when he was coming up the stairs, he met the mailman, he was bringing the mail. It was about 10 o'clock. And the mailman and him had a few words. Uh, the mailman said, this is great weather. He said, it is good for both you and I. And that was that. The mailman couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe what? That he had died. Oh. Because he seemed fine. Couldn't believe it. Well, did he have any plans for retirement? Had he had, had you had a chance to talk to him about what you might do when he retired? Um, the um, the last, of course, he didn't live to retire. Um, about a month or so before, he said, "I've gone through a hard winter, which was hard, cold. The winters were cold." And he said, "I'll get what I can." and retire. And he was only 62. And he said, then we'll go with the weather. Wherever the weather is nice, we'll mm -hmm. go there. So he was thinking Florida or somewhere much warmer. Oh, I'd go down to Florida or go someplace you'd get around. Mm -hmm. And the weather was so bad in Chicago. They were freezing. They couldn't even, they're trying to make change in that. Their hands were frozen. Right. Doors are open all the time. I imagine that'd be really tough on your health. That was tough. Um, so no, uh, you know, back to this illness. No serious illness ran in the Baird family, like or the or the Dean family for that matter, like cancer or. In my kind? family, yeah. no. No real serious. No, no. My father died at the age of seventy-eight of a ruptured appendix. Oh, something. Gangrene had set in. Something preventable. And mm -hmm. and um, uh, my brother John and him were up in Dublin on a fair the evening before, and he complained, and, and somebody said, he never drank whiskey. Why don't you go in and get a good shot of brandy? It'll maybe help that pain. So anyway, he did, and he come home, and he didn't say nothing when he come home. So my mother said the next day, uh, my brother and him were going to the bog, that's where the cut turf. Mm -hmm. And so he, he, he went, he didn't say nothing. So when he got out to the, to the where they were working, he said to my brother, I'm sick. So he took him home. And our bedrooms were upstairs, so my mother called the doctor right away and he came over. And he said, he looked at him. Hmm. He said, I can't do nothing. Why? He walked out the door and he said, I'll be back in 10 minutes. I'll come back, he was dead. Boy. And that was so preventable, if you know. The gangrene yeah. killed him when my tree system. Otherwise, he would live to be, you know, maybe 80 or 90. Mm hmm. Because he was wiry, he was thin, and mm -hmm. quite active. Well, that's how fast he went. So, the, as far as you know, the Dean family, they don't have any cancer or no, leukemia no, or anything no, like that. And, no, and, no, 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 no. And uh, the Barretts, as far as we know, that's they, they coronary disease, I guess, would be... Well, um... Uh, like, what did Uncle John die of? Uncle John died. He, he was eating lunch, they were getting ready to move, and he went right off the chair. Not a word spoken, and he hadn't been sick either. It was the heart. Mm -hmm. How old was he? How old was he? Mm -hmm. He was. He wasn't. He wasn't retiring age either. <laughs> His uh, one of the kids called me up and was on a Sunday, and he's uh, Jackie. He said, "Aunt Mary, I got bad news." I said, "What?" He said, Dad just dropped dead 
fell off the chair. We were eating lunch, getting ready. They were moving. And I said, God, I knew his mother had been sick for years, but uh, he was the last one. Mm -hmm. Not a word spoken right like that. Any other Barretts that you know of that died of coronary disease? Uh, Sounds like the men have a problem. No, no, the last two just died, the two brothers at home. And so uh, they were in their 80s. So they lived to be pretty old. 80, 89. Yeah. 85, then no, they lived. And the Uncle Frank lived to be a good age, too. I think he was 89. But he didn't die of heart disease. No, he died of old age. Right. Right. Like me. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's about your age. That he was. He's the age you are now. Was he like, what was he, 89, did you say? I think he was 89. Because I remember him. Yeah, he was a big man. Mm -hmm. He went blind, and he was he was laid up. He, He's a big man. I'm looking at some of my notes of things I hadn't talked about yet. I remember hearing a story of my, my grandfather, your husband, um, hearing the Lusitania sink. Um, the Lusitania was torpedoed off the coast of Ireland in 1916. And I remember you. he told me, or you told me, or my dad told me that he heard that happen. Oh, the, the uh, Titanic? Yeah. He heard the screams. Of when the when the you know when the Titanic hits, because they're on the coastline. Right. Now. He said he never in his life screamed, people scream and yelling. Oh man. That was the night the Titanic. So he. Did you see that? Yes, I did. I did. I don't care to see those things because I've been across that ocean four times. <laughs> I don't care for. It. Yeah, I saw. I've seen it twice. It was very But good. it happened 85 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just trying to, I've gone through most of my mother's kind of factual stuff. Um, do you, now you lived on Ohio. What was the address of that house on Ohio? 5002 West Ohio. 5002 West Ohio. And when you bought the house, it We bought that house for $4,000. Okay. We moved from, we were living by Aunt Molly on uh, Congress Street, 3521 Congress, away down. Mm -hmm. Well, the neighborhood was getting bad, very bad. Mm -hmm. And the kids were getting just about ready for school. So we had to have a place near the school. So we got out and we, we knew this guy, he used to rent, take the rental up at the tavern, you know. You come in and pick it up once a month, and was in the real estate business. So I talked to him one day, and he said, I have a nice house, he said, I, and it will be near near the school and near everything. He was Catholic. And he said, why don't you go out and look at it? It's $4,000. And it had the basement, mm -hmm. and we had the six rooms, and mm -hmm. there was a five-room attic upstairs. A five room attic, really. Five rooms, a full attic. People that we, when we moved in there, the people lived there, they've been living there for years and were from Sweden. But anyway, we, we bought it for ourselves, you know, make, there wasn't that much money in it to begin with mm -hmm. to rent. They paid $19 a month for five rooms. Boy. And the basement rented for 12, four rooms. So were they both occupied when you bought yeah, the house? Yeah. So that helped with the, the house payments? Yeah, 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 yeah. And you had a barn in the back? The huh? guy would come that had a mortgage on it, he'd come once a month. Oh, no, no, he didn't come once a month. I think he came about every six months. He had some kind of a mortgage, $50 he used to. Well, we paid $50 a month and was paid off. Mm -hmm. So, but we spent about $17,000 with everything new there. Mm -hmm. New windows, new porches, new bathrooms. Mm -hmm. It was an older house. It was, and a new two-car garage. Yeah. And all I got out of it was seventeen. Hmm. Well, that's because the cause... were knocking on the doors around there. And uh, your grandfather said to me before he died, he said, 
this house is paid for, he said, live here alone, don't have anybody, don't be bothered with tenants fighting and, you know, noise all night long. He said, the place is paid for you can't afford to live in it. You don't need the irritation. Be alone. Yeah. Um, and the, the chickaboos moved in, that was it. And that's what happened to your property value. That's why you didn't get anything for the house. Yeah, well, anyway, people were selling. Fights were going out of there like mad. Couldn't go out in the street, you couldn't go shop. And once they took over, that was it. And you moved out of there in what, 1968? Something like that? Yeah. Um, after, um, after, um, well, I, I lived there seven years after my husband died, and I worked over at Simpsons. Simpsons Electric? Simpsons Electric. I worked there every day. So then, uh, we put the house for sale. We had an awful time. They wanted me to take down the attic. The building people were, well, it was City Hall, it was a bunch of crooks. And they were coming out inspecting and saying that the attic was built later. Well, nothing was built later. Everything was there when we went in there and people live in there. And uh, there was a front and back entrance. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they took me into court five times, and I fought it all the way through. The one guy come, come out one day, we're going to knock the attic down over my dead body. I said, you're not knocking anything down here. So anyway, I'm back into court again. There were all of us, and you had to go, mm -hmm. subpoena, mm -hmm. you went. And I had the poor old soul upstairs, Mrs. Mountful, all alone. And she'd been there, well, she was there about 10 years when we bought the place. And she was crying and going, won't have a home. Well, I dragged her down one day down to the court. And um, uh, I come before the same judge. I was worn out, but I was, had that woman and I was young at the time. <laughs> I'm going to show those so and so they're not going to come in here and move anything because this house is as it was, mm -hmm. built. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I had to get a hold of the owner, the original owner. His name was Olson. And I asked him about the house. He said, no, that, we, that was there, it was built like that. When was the house built? So anyway, he's, I said, they want me to take the attic. I said, no, no, that's, uh, we got the papers. Good. And I had the papers on, on the whole thing. I had the basement done over. And they wanted to tell me it was drywall. And I had the papers from the plaster <laughs> that plastered every wall in that place. Your grandfather was alive at the time. Yeah. And he watched them. And they <laughs> plastered the whole place. <laughs> so when I went out to court <laughs> the last time, the judge looked at me and he said, are you in the building business? I said, no. <laughs> and he said, you seem to know a lot about it. I said, I do. And he stamped the thing and he said, <laughs> That's great. Um, so you ended up selling that house and made 17, you get got 17,000 for that. We you, paid for for it. Yeah. But as I say, we, we put everything in it. We, I think we paid. Tradesmen were getting, you know, higher, but it was a nice home. I mm -hmm. had everything in it. Mm -hmm. So. I'm just trying to. I'm trying to. Well, then I got. Uh, I. Uh, I had a call from Ireland. That my mother was dying. She was in the hospital. My sister called me, and if if I could make it, so I had the furniture all lined up. The niggers were coming in, and I had everything lined up, what I wanted. I wanted the twin beds and my couch, and uh, enough for the three rooms. And it, it went into storage, mm -hmm. because uh, I wanted to have that when I come back. Mm -hmm. And I went downtown that afternoon to get my, uh, my uh, passport 
to the um, immigration place. And I told her my story. And she said, you know, you can't, you can't get a passport. You're, I did have one, but it, it ran out. But she said, seeing what's going on, you know, she said, we'll issue an emergency passport. But she said, you have to go over to the passport office and I'll get the papers ready but when you come back, this office will be closed. But we'll let you in and we'll have everything ready for you. So that's how I... And that worked? I worked, yeah. yeah. And you got back over there? And then I, I, uh, I left and I uh, had to go. I couldn't get a direct route, um, plane. I had to go to New York and get the plane and you I well I flew from O'Hare but they told me out there that they had already contacted with New York and they would have a, there was a plane coming in there and it would be leaving for Ireland and if you make it on time but see they only took the the money for the flight from from O'Hare they didn't take the full price mm -hmm. I paid to New York and then when I got down there I had to get right away over to the uh, to the uh, plane and get pick up my ticket and pay for it from there. Then I bought a, a round trip ticket, mm -hmm. and we flew to Boston from there. To imagine, I sometimes I sit and wonder how I did it. Getting out of my house and all the commotion, mm -hmm. and then this thing happened. I wanted to get home. So we flew from New York, I flew from O'Hare to, to New York and from New York to Boston. And they stopped again. I don't know where they picked up another group. The plane was packed. And when I got into Dublin, uh, it was on a Sunday and everything was closed. And there was nobody there because you didn't have the telephone connections, you know. There was nobody there to meet me. And I'm standing, walking around, and running around. I'm walking around, looking to see. And the girl was working there, and she said, "Are you waiting for somebody?" And I said, "I am." But I said they didn't know what time I was coming. And she said, "Where are you from?" I said, "I'm from Moat. It was a long way from Dublin." So anyway, she said, "Wait a minute. I'll get on the phone." And she got connections across the street from our house at a phone. Hmm. And my sister came to the phone and she said, we didn't know you were, uh, we didn't know when you were coming in. So she said, we we're getting contact with, with Dublin. I have all these cousins in Dublin. Mm -hmm. And they were all at church. So anyway, the next thing you know, when they come out of church, they were over there and they picked me up. Oh, and wow. they took me over to their house and uh, I got two girl cousins there, and uh, I got three, three uh, men cousins, mm -hmm. and they took me over to their house. We had something to eat, and we took off right away, down down for our place, which was fifty two miles. Fifty two miles. Fifty two miles from. Fifty two miles. Yeah. yeah, they're Irish miles. So there's a difference in the miles. Really. Yeah. They're measured different. Uh -huh. Is it like based on metric system or? I don't know what it is, but there's a difference. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I had no sleep for two or three days. And uh, when I got there, they they were already all waiting for me. And of course, they all had cars, so we took down for, for moat. And when we got there, after all this riding, my brother said, we're going to Athlone, seven miles. My mother was still alive. Mm -hmm. So he said, we're, two carloads of it went into Athlone to the hospital. The hospital was closed. Oh. <laughs> and when my brother came up to the door, he said to the guy, this is my sister from the States, and she's got to see her mother. He said, I cannot let you in, John. 
He said, rules and regulations. Everybody's asleep. This place is locked tight. And he said, I can't do it. Well, my other cousin, John, was with him. He came up and took a look at him. He said, uh, we won't make any noise. We just go in and come out. Well, he said, remember, I'm going against the rules. But he said, see who it is. Crawling, you can come in and just, you know, no noise, wake up the other patient. So we got in to see her. <laughs> and she was asleep and we were all there. Of course, they had been there during the day. And I went up and I kissed her and shook hands with her. I said to her, do you know who it is? She said, sure, I know. It's Maisie. They always call me Maisie. Yeah. And I said, are you sure? And she said, yes, how is Petey and Mary Jane? <laughs> <laughs> So we really got in and out of there. And by that time, when we got back to Moat again, it was about midnight. Well, I was so tired, I couldn't even sleep. And the house was full of company. Yeah. They all were all there because my cousin lived downtown. What? So did she live much longer after that? She lived, uh, I come back here May 1st. She lived about a month. Mm -hmm. And we went in every day and visited. She died old age? Old age. Yeah. She was in her late 80s? 95. She was 95. Mm -hmm. 95. And she, and you told me earlier, but I forgot, she was a um, housewife, uh, worked on oh, work. every day she worked. I mean, in the house, she yeah. had a big mm -hmm. house. And we had cattle, and she always liked chickens and geese and mm -hmm. ducks. She had all of her. But anyway, she was busy all the time. Is her house still there? The house is still there, yes. Just about fallen down. My brother it was a big house with three bedrooms upstairs. And downstairs there was a kitchen, a dining room, and a living room. And uh, he didn't take care of it. Is he so still living? He let it go to pieces. Is anyone living there? The house is there. And he got one of those trailer things, you know? Yeah. And they give them to them over there. There are about six rooms and they're free. They give them everything free. Mm -hmm. So they were, they offered him, because they didn't want him to live in the house, you know? There was no hot water, there was no heat or anything. They offered him a trailer, a six room trailer. He said, if I can put it in my own backyard. Well, they. They put it in the backyard, right behind the house. It's got a big gate. Nobody can come in there. And he's in the back. What's the address of the house? Do you remember? Huh? What's the address of the house? The Gap Moat. That's the only address I'd ever have. The Gap Moat. The Gap. G-A-P Moat. Huh. M-O-A-T. And he lives in the trailer? He lives in the back there. Yeah. Does he own the uh, the land he where He owns the... everything. I'll be back. Okay. And <laughs> he pays no taxes. Uh. Sorry, independent. Yeah? He followed the trade, you know. Very few people can do that. Some of them have a bunch of kids. And they don't do what their parents did. Yeah. But he still lives there and he still owns a lot of land in, in, uh, in Moat. Moat. Yeah. Is this my grandfather's watch? Huh? This stopwatch here? This That's his watch. I gave it to Peter that was born. He bought that when he came in 1920 when he went to work for the motor coach. It was hanging. I guess he's, he took it off the hook. It's it's all packed up like it's uh, it's going to St. Louis. <laughs> it's not going with me. I gave it to your dad. Well, don't let him forget it, cause I. Nineteen twenty. I think that thing's great.